Hey guys, welcome back for another video, but welcome to my very first episode of Frightening Fridays. <laughs> so I figured that there's really no better way than to kickstart your weekend than by falling asleep and listening to me talk about a super creepy story, legend, myth, or creature. <laughs> so, happy Friday. Hope you had a fantastic week. And let's get into today's frightening story. So, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a woman by the name of Hedy Fredrickson. Now, while this story is about a ghost and a haunted house, I feel like out of respect for Hetty, but also just to kind of delve a little bit deeper into the story, it's a pretty good idea to go into a little bit of her history and who she was, because she led a pretty fascinating life. I think the larger part of Hedy Fredrickson's legacy was the fact that she was a super accomplished artist and painter. But I don't think it would be fair to not kind of talk about the events and the things that happened in her life that probably largely contributed to her fascination with and just development of her artistic abilities. So we're going to go a little bit into that. Her art, on its own, um, is probably what Hedy Fredrickson is most well known for. Probably even more so than the pretty famous haunting that she experienced. Um, but yeah, let's get into her life first. So Hedy immigrated to Canada, um, and for many years, up until the end of her life, actually lived in British Columbia and she actually lived in two places both of which I have either lived in or lived very close to so this story is pretty cool because it hits very close to home for me and I'm excited to share it with you <laughs> so this is the story about Hedy Mulder Fredrickson and her haunted painting so Hedy Mulder Fredrickson was a very fascinating woman, and I really enjoyed researching this case. She was born in 1921 um, in what was called the Dutch East Indies. Now, I didn't know this until actually researching this, but in 1800, um, the Dutch East Indies was founded, and it was a Dutch colony um, in what is now Indonesia. So her father was a lawyer for the Dutch government, and from what I understand, Hedy and her family lived a pretty lavish, beautiful lifestyle. <laughs> uh, for most of the year, they lived in this beautiful tropical paradise, and then Every couple years or so, they would get on a ship, go back to the Netherlands, which is where they were originally from, to visit family, and go on beautiful vacations. <laughs> so Hedy spent a lot of her childhood in the Netherlands, as well as the Dutch East Indies, but she also got to spend a lot of time skiing in the Swiss Alps, as well as going on beautiful, sun-drenched beach vacations <laughs> to the French Riviera and just beautiful places like that. Now, on one of these very last family vacations, um, right before the family was set to go back to the Dutch East Indies, Hedy said, um, you know, I'm old enough, I don't really want to go back there. I kind of wanted to stay in the Netherlands. Now, at the time, she had an older sister named Janny who was living in the Netherlands for school. I believe Hedy was about 18 years old at the time, 
so she technically was old enough to live on her own, but um, this was early 1939, so her parents were severely apprehensive of letting both of their daughters stay there because, of course, there were rumors going around about a possible war. However, the Dutch government assured her parents that the Netherlands were safe, nothing was going to happen, and so they took that to heart, and they went back to the Dutch East Indies with Hedy's younger sister, and left Hedy to stay in the care of her older sister. So, while in the Netherlands, Hedy actually enrolled in something that was called household school, now, I'm sure that this um, existed or exists in many other countries, but basically what it was, was a school where young people could go to learn how to cook. Um, they learned basic nutrition skills, cooking skills, household skills, everything like that. And it basically was just something to really help them prepare for jobs in like the maid and the cleaning industry and if that wasn't the plan then it would definitely help them just prepare for their futures if they were planning on becoming mothers and becoming wives so um while Henny is attending school of course in the early hours of may 10th 1940 nazi germany invades the netherlands and now Hedy and her older sister, Janny, find themselves living in an occupied country. According to the stuff I read, they said that at first they still had contact and communication with their parents in the Dutch East Indies because they were still allowed to send letters and speak with them and everything like that. But of course, only a short time afterwards, Japan invaded the Dutch East Indies, and this was when contact with their family was completely severed, so they had no idea what was going on with them. Also, around this time, Hedy's older sister, Janny, unfortunately passed away. She apparently died from choking on a peanut. So now, Hedy really was all alone. So during the last two years of the war, Hedy actually became a member of the Dutch resistance. And this just makes me like her even more because it just makes her sound like a bit of a badass. So I really like this woman and I hope you're enjoying the story so far because it's about to get even more interesting as we delve into the haunting. So, um, her parents were very unfortunately separated and put into concentration camps. However, they were alive, and in 1946, a ship brought her whole family, both of her parents and her sibling. Um, they docked at the port of Amsterdam, and they were all reunited. And then a short time after the war ended, after Hedy's parents were back and they were reunited, Hedy and her boyfriend, Jack, were married and they welcomed two young sons. And Hedy really kind of was able to just take a breather. And this is where she actually started to get very into art and painting. So Hedy was a painter. She loved art. This was what she became known for it, and she actually had a very specific style of artwork, which was surrealism. Now, I found this super interesting because I didn't know this at all, and this is the reason for why I thought it would be cool to kind of delve into the darker part of Hetty's history. So apparently, surrealistic art, or surrealism, developed in Europe in the aftermath of World War I, um, and it was largely influenced by Dada or Dadaism. I'm so sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. 
but this was an art movement literally formed in reaction to the horrors and the folly of the war. So let me give you the actual definition of surrealistic art. Surrealist art is literally fantastic or incongruous imagery or effects by means of unnatural or irrational juxtapositions and combinations. So, this incredible art style was what Hetty painted in, and you have to wonder if everything that she went through in the Netherlands really is what inspired her to pick this amazing art style. And she actually had such a talent for painting that a very well-known art collector took notice of her work and bought a lot of it and actually put it up in an art gallery in Paris. However, from what I can tell, nothing more, at least in the Netherlands, really came of this um, sale because a short time after this, Hedy divorced Jack and decided to pack up her two young sons and move to Canada. So I couldn't find any major information on Hedy's specific reason for wanting to move to Canada. Um, again, it may have just been because she was looking for more opportunities, a different job, something more exciting, or it could have been just because of the divorce and she wanted to start a new life. But apparently at this time, the Dutch government was literally giving free tickets to people to board a ship <laughs> and head over to Canada. I believe Canada at the time was in like dire need of workers, so this may have been another push or motivation for her to move to a different country. So they got on the ship and they traveled to Montreal. However, when they got to Quebec, they quickly realized that this was not the province for them, <laughs> for whatever reason. So they immediately boarded a train, and they traveled all the way west, and landed in Vancouver. In Vancouver, Hedy managed to find a job at a bakery, but I believe she was fired relatively quickly for falling asleep and letting all of the <laughs> bread burn. So, Hedy and her two young sons were now trapped in a new country <laughs> without a job and without any real plans but being a super strong and very proud woman Hedy refused to call her family in the Netherlands and ask for any help so her and her sons just kept trucking along <laughs> and she eventually found another job as a housekeeper now, this housekeeping job was on a 500-acre ranch in the Caribou region of BC. Now, the Caribou region is quite a long distance from Vancouver, but they made the trip out there, and Hetty took the job. The only thing that was wrong with this job was the fact that the rancher who hired her agreed to give Hetty and her sons a roof over their head, food for them to eat in exchange for housekeeping, but he was not going to give them any other monetary incentives. So Hetty only ended up working there for about one summer before she said, this, this isn't it. Like, I'm not making any money. I'm unable to save for the future. If we stay here, we're probably going to be stuck here. So, luckily, <laughs> while she had been into town one day off of the ranch, she picked up a copy of the province newspaper and she saw an ad for another housekeeping job. Now, this job was located in Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. So, luckily, a neighbor to the rancher she was currently working for offered to drive her and her sons all the way back to Vancouver where they boarded a ferry in Nanaimo and they headed over to Vancouver Island. 
I like this part of the story because Eddie didn't know at the time, but the person that she was going to interview with for the new housekeeping job was actually her future husband. <laughs> so the man who had placed the ad for the housekeeping job, his name was Douglas T. Fredrickson, and he was newly divorced, and he was caring for three children all on his own, and was just completely overwhelmed. <laughs> so he needed a housekeeper to live with him and help him raise his children and take care of them. So Eddie obviously got the job, <laughs> and a very, very short time into it, her and Douglas fell in love. They blended their beautiful little family together, and things were really just starting to look up for Hetty. She got back into painting. Her artistic skills were able to blossom and bloom again because she was finally probably so relieved that things were just finally settling down and she was happy again. So in 1964, Hetty and Douglas married and they actually decided to move from Vancouver Island back to the mainland. And they chose to move to this little town at the time called Chilliwack. Chilliwack's not that small anymore, by the way. <laughs> but Chilliwack is located in the Fraser Valley, which is a little bit away from Vancouver. So here, they purchased a beautiful old mansion, which was located at 3 to William Street North. Um, because they had a very large family now with five children, they thought this beautiful, big, old house would be just the perfect size for them. But that wasn't the main reason that Hetty loved the house so much. <laughs> she loved the look of the house because it literally looked like a castle. She thought it was super inspiring, and she knew that her painting and her artwork would just be able to flourish there. And the house really did look like a castle, um, because it had a turret on the top of the roof, topped off with what is called a witch's hat. <laughs> so it was very Halloween-y, castle-y looking from the outside. Um, obviously there was a ton of room on the inside. It was like a 12 to 14 room home. Um, and yeah, Hedy just knew it was going to be a perfect fit for her family. And she was really excited to get moved in, get settled down and start painting again. So she started painting and she also started teaching art classes. Um, and she was also the president of the Fraser Valley Brush and Palette Club, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and she became known locally around town as the wonderfully eccentric artist. <laughs> now, this is where our story really starts to kick off, because as soon as they moved into the home, really strange things started happening, like, almost instantaneously. <laughs> so the mansion itself had 12 to 14 rooms. One of the rooms was at the very top of the stairs, located in, obviously, a hallway. But it was from this top room where they would hear footsteps going up the stairs, a very distinctive very loud, clearly human footsteps. And they would hear the footsteps when every member of the family was accounted for <laughs> and in front of their eyes. Um, the bedroom where they would hear the footsteps go into wasn't being used by any of them, but it did have an old iron bed in, on the floor, and it also had a chest of drawers. So, they would hear all the time loud footsteps going up the stairs into this bedroom, and it would move, whatever it was, 
something would move the very heavy iron bed around and it would very loudly slam the drawers of the chest. They would also go in the room, open the drawers, only to come back later to have them closed or open and vice versa. And the most interesting thing about this ghost that they assumed it was, <laughs> was it had some pretty specific characteristics. So one, it was very loud. So when it would go up the stairs, the footsteps that it would make were super loud in comparison to any of them that were living in the house. Two, it would breathe really heavily. <laughs> so Hetty and Douglas reported all the time that whatever this thing was, it breathed very, very loudly. And it was obvious that it was none of them or their children in the house. And three, <laughs> this ghost um, had a very, very strong odor. And it had a very strong odor of a female or a woman's perfume. So it smelled good, which was super odd. <laughs> and it wasn't, um, it wasn't just sounds. Um, Hetty began to see what she described as a misty, glowing shape moving up and down the hallway upstairs. And it had the distinctive shape of a human. So, <laughs> while these four characteristics would have been creepy enough for most people, Hetty also began having a very scary recurring nightmare. And it happened again um, almost as soon as they moved into the house. And she said that this nightmare was literally scarier than the actual physical things that they could hear and see of the ghost. Um, not necessarily just the images and the vividness of the nightmare itself, but the way that it made her feel was truly terrifying. So the nightmare that she was having was of a room and it was a room that she couldn't pinpoint, a room that she had never seen before. But in this room, she saw very clearly a woman lying on the floor, and this woman was wearing a red dress with yellow flowers on it. And she describes this woman in her dream as having a terrified look on her face, and she's also covering her face with her arms, kind of in defense. And surrounding this woman, lying on the floor, is a bunch of dust or debris that Hetty can't exactly pinpoint, but she says that the floor just looks very dirty in her nightmares. And she has this dream of this woman every single night. Now, it is this recurring nightmare that doesn't seem to be stopping at any time soon, um, along with the loud footsteps, the heavy breathing, and the distinct smell of a very fragrant woman's perfume that finally made Hetty say, <laughs> okay, I'm going into town and I'm going to talk to some people to see if I can try and figure out what is going on here. And the interesting thing is that she couldn't find a ton of information. The people or the residents of Chilliwack at the time, um, all they really knew about the house was that it was built in 1912. Um, there had been two different men living there within a 10-year time span. And both of these men had unfortunately committed suicide. And there was also a pretty creepy rumor going around that at one point a young woman had been murdered in the house and her body had been cemented into a fireplace. So, <laughs> um, this information freaked Hetty out. And she inquired a little bit further, 
But the creepy thing was that literally no blueprints or like documents or major information about how and when the house was built existed. So that was kind of weird. <laughs> so I think this was enough for Hetty and Douglas to um, not quite make them leave the house, <laughs> but it made them a little more curious than it did scared. So they began investigating their own home. So they started looking around the house, trying to see if they could find the chimney where a body had been disposed of. Now, they never found a body or any evidence of anything like that. However, <laughs> they did find um, hidden and concealed rooms, which had never been shown to them. They were clearly not supposed to be found when they bought the house, but they found them. <laughs> so after they discovered a hidden door, um, they found a boarded over and concealed passageway, and this led to a hidden bedroom. This bedroom was located within the turret on top of the roof, the very thing that made Hedy want the house because it made it look like a castle. And the interesting thing is the fact that these turrets um, are and never were meant to have any sort of room in them. They're meant to be empty and they're meant to be just a decoration. So there, there shouldn't have been a room in there and they didn't know why this particular one had been concealed. So the thing that gave me probably the most goosebumps about this story is as soon as they found this hidden room and opened the door, Hetty immediately recognized this room even though she had never seen it in real life before, this was the room and the floor from her nightmares. It was even complete with the dust or debris that Hetty could see so clearly in the room that the woman was lying on top of. However, um, it turned out it wasn't dust or dirt or anything like that. It was actually insulation that had been falling off of the walls. So it was around this time that Hetty told Douglas, I'm going to start ripping all the walls down. <laughs> I'm going to rip the chimney down and I am going to find this poor woman who is probably um, buried and cemented in our chimney. But this is where Douglas kind of put his foot down and said, mm, honey, this is our home. We're not going to start tearing all of the walls down. So they didn't do that. So they had found this super creepy concealed room. And right after this, this is where Heidi says that the uh, misty glowing shape that she had seen really started to take more, um, it started be to become more realistic. Like, it started to take on less of a misty look and more of an actual human look. So she was absolutely certain that the breathing, the footsteps, the perfume were all coming from this misty ghost shape that was walking around the home. And Hetty was also certain now that the woman from her nightmare, the woman who was probably murdered and put into the chimney, this was her. This was her ghost. And being such an amazing artist, Hetty decided she wanted to paint the portrait of this woman. She knew her face in her mind so clearly from her nightmares, so she was positive that she would be able to paint this woman's picture and bring her to life a little bit. She was probably hoping that she could maybe show it around to the people of Chilliwack and ask if they knew who she was, but at the very least, she was hoping that by painting the ghost's portrait, 
maybe it would somehow give the ghost motivation to come forward and maybe even speak with her. And so Hetty began painting the portrait and she really wanted to give the portrait the same eeriness and creepy feeling that the dream gave to Hetty. So in order to accomplish this, what she did was she left half of the portrait completely blank. She only began painting one side of the face. And this is where things got really weird. <laughs> because despite being such an amazing artist, Hetty felt that she, for some reason, even though she could so clearly see the woman's face in her mind, like she knew the face, she knew she could paint it, for some reason, it never worked out. She just couldn't get the paint onto the canvas. And what happened um, a couple of weeks down the road after she had been trying so hard to paint this face, the painting, the blank side that she had intentionally left blank, began to develop its own features, not done by the hand of Hetty. <laughs> And the interesting thing was that despite Hetty painting a female's face on the one side, the painting on the other side that was appearing out of nowhere and on its own was a male's face. Hetty even woke up one morning and went to look at the painting, and on the other side of it, there was a beard suddenly painted on it, and she had no explanation for what was going on. <laughs> she even brought the painting to her art students, and all of them claimed to have also seen the painting taking on a life of its own and developing masculine features that had not been painted by Hetty or by anybody else. Hetty's husband, Douglas, was a logger. That was what he did for work, and so he was often gone for weeks at a time working. So I totally get this. Um, <laughs> Hetty was getting a little bit tired of being all alone with her children, but alone um, without her husband in this very creepy haunted house. <laughs> um, however, Hetty was suddenly not entirely alone because the possessed or haunted painting, which is what it became known as, um, started gathering a lot of attention around Chilliwack, around province, and even out of province. So, <laughs> um, the small town of Chilliwack at the time actually gained quite a bit of popularity and fame because of Hetty's ghost. And the media frenzy really kicked off um, when Hetty was featured in the Chilliwack Progress newspaper. So the newspaper at the time would feature somebody from the community and would interview them. And the May 19th, 1966 edition of the community portal ran with the title of She Likes Living in a Haunted House. And this interview was all about Hetty, and she had mentioned um, the haunting <laughs> that was going on in their house. And at first, the Fredericksons kind of welcomed the popularity and the publicity because, I guess, um, it was exciting. They were the most talked about ghost story within the province at the time. And Hetty even ended up inviting two reporters, one from the province and one from the Vancouver Sun, to come into the home and spend the night in the haunted bedroom. The reporters said that they never actually saw a ghost, but they did hear some very loud very strange sounds that they couldn't account for, um, and they also saw a piece of linoleum moving on its own. 
so maybe they saw a little bit of activity we'll never know <laughs> but um apparently this story got so big in and around bc and even out of province and even out of country that to accommodate the sheer volume of tourists that were suddenly showing up on her front yard Hetty actually applied for a haunted house business license because of the number of people who were showing up so Hetty and Douglas's house was literally being flocked to by people just wanting to get a glimpse of Hetty of the painting and possibly of the ghost <laughs> And one day in 1966, um, upwards of 700 people had gathered on Hetty's front porch trying to look into the windows and the weight of all of these people actually broke her stairs and her porch. <laughs> so this was kind of um, the last straw. And so, <laughs> because they were tired of living with this creepy ghost, um, they were tired of all of the constant publicity, and because in 1967 the logging industry was um, booming on northern Vancouver Island, they decided to move back to Vancouver Island. They thought it would be a good move for them. So that is what they did. Um, Douglas took a new job, and right before Hetty went to the island to join him, um, she decided to do a quick trip back to Holland to visit her family for a little vacation. And she took the infamous painting with her. While she was in Holland, she had like a world-famous parapsychologist come and examine the painting. And his exact words were that the painting definitely has extraordinary spiritual influences over it, but he couldn't really tell her any more about it. <laughs> so, from what I read, um, numerous people offered to purchase the painting from Hetty because it was so famous and so intriguing probably for a lot of money as well, um, but Hetty refused all of them. She said that because this painting had just become such a big part of her life and her existence at the time, she didn't want to part with it, and something about selling it just felt off, didn't feel right to her. However, um, a radio station in Vancouver did ask her if she would be willing to donate the painting to them. They were doing a Halloween haunted house auction, and all of the proceeds were going to an orphanage. So this is where Hetty said, definitely, this is where my painting is going to go to because it's for a really good cause. So she donated the painting um, to the auction, and she said the very last time that she saw the face in the painting, it looked old and threatening, <laughs> but it made a lot of money for parentless children. So the creepy haunted painting um, actually ended on a pretty happy note. Now, there were several other occupants of the house, because I'm sure you're wondering what happened to it. <laughs> um, so first, a bunch of artists and two different bands actually moved into the home. Um, the bands set up all of their equipment in the basement, and that was where they practiced and where they played, and the home be apparently became full of like writers and painters and poets and just it was just a very big art house which kind of sounds cool except for the fact that I'm pretty sure they were all squatters and they were living there completely illegally <laughs> um, and the people of Chilliwack at the time just assumed that Hetty and Douglas knew about this but they didn't 
so the police were called and all of the artists were immediately escorted out of the house. Um, after that, a family with two children and a dog moved in to rent it and they said that the house was definitely occupied by a ghost and the ghost would even sit down with them and watch TV. <laughs> the house was actually sold in 1972 to a man named James Kipp and he only ended up living in the house for one year before he sold it again for only $23,000 and he actually refused to comment on his reasons for wanting to move out so quickly so that was kind of interesting <laughs> but the realtor who sold the house for Mr. Kip actually had a pretty funny approach for how he went about um, showcasing the house <laughs> so he took out an ad in the paper and he said that a beautiful six-bedroom mansion is available for $23,000. You can own the six-bedroom home with a new roof and a very old ghost. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that was kind of funny um, to just embrace the fact that it was now such a popular home to maybe kind of entice people into buying it if they were afraid of it. <laughs> so, um, I don't think a lot of people know this side of Hedy Fredrickson. I think she's probably more well known for the huge art exhibit that her and Douglas opened after they moved back to Vancouver Island. And this art exhibit was called The Valley of 1000 Faces. And I have to check with my mom because I have some images in my head of possibly having been there when I was really little. I'll have to get back to you guys on that because I think I may have actually been there at one point. <laughs> but anyways, um... So what Hetty did was she literally painted a thousand different portraits, 1,000 of them, and she painted them on the sawed-off ends of cedar trees, so the big flat butt end of the tree. She painted these beautiful portraits from celebrities and just people from all over the world. Her and Douglas purchased four acres of parkland and just pure forest. And what they did was they fastened all of these portraits um, high into the trees. And they didn't change the parkland or the forest in any way. They left it completely natural. But they fastened all of the pictures along the trees of the natural pathway. So the exhibit was literally going in, walking the natural path of the forest, while seeing all these amazing portraits looking down at you from the tree lines. So they opened this exhibit in 1969, and it ran for the public all the way up until 1994, when Hetty unfortunately passed away. Um, I think it's super sweet that despite the fact that, that this exhibit got quite popular, um, Hedy never once in 25 years ever raised the admission price. Adults were only charged one dollar to come in and walk the pathways, and children were always free. So I always thought that was kind of a sweet little detail. <laughs> so, um, sadly... Only eight years after Hetty and Douglas moved to Vancouver Island, um, the house, the mansion, actually burned to the ground. Apparently, a faulty water heater in the basement started a fire and completely destroyed the entire house from top to bottom. Um, the house that sits there now, it's 
pretty much built like in the exact same location and the exact same distance from the road so i don't know there's something kind of eerie about it when you see pictures because it looks so similar and it really has to make you wonder like if there really was a ghost in the house would it now be gone like was it attached to the original home um or if you build up around it is the ghost now in the new home perhaps when Hetty was painting the portrait of her ghost you also have to stop and wonder if it was real was it the ghost painting the features on the other side of the portrait that were just mysteriously showing up and if it really was the woman who had been killed maybe she was trying to paint the portrait of the person who killed her you have to wonder these sorts of things because there's just so many unanswered questions and you never know <laughs> um i hope you enjoyed this episode of frightening fridays i hope you found it fascinating i have such a huge passion for creepy interesting unexplainable stories like this and i hope you liked it too if you did enjoy it i really hope to see you again on monday for menacing mondays because i will be talking about a very true very creepy true crime so i hope to see you then i hope you enjoyed frightening fridays and i'll hopefully see you again for menacing monday take care Bye.